Kings chapter 9 to start with. <clears throat> Second Kings chapter 9. We'll actually be in chapter 9 and chapter 10 today. I thought about doing it in two parts, um, but I think I can get it all in one sermon, so we're going to do best we can to go over this story about Jehu. And so I just want to read, why don't you go ahead and stand if you would, and I'll just read a, a couple verses out of cha uh, chapter, I mean, uh, 2 Kings 9, and then a couple verses out of chapter 10. And then the rest of the time we'll go through it a little bit at a time to, to tell the story. So 2 Kings chapter 9, let's, let me just read verse 9 and 10. It says, And I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah, and all the dog uh, and the dogs shall eat Jezebel in the portion of Jezreel, and there shall be none to bury her. And he opened uh, the door and fled. Look at chapter uh, fifth, uh, chapter nine, verse fifteen. And when he was departed thence, he lighted on Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, coming to meet him. And he saluted him and said to him, Is thine heart right as thy heart is with thy heart? And Jonadab answered, It is. If it be, give me thine hand. And he gave him his hand, and he took him up uh, to him into a chariot. And he said, Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. So they made him ride, he made him ride in his chariot. Lord, I pray you bless the reading of your word now and bless the sermon. I help, I let it help us in our Christian life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. I feel like I messed something up on that first chapter. Uh, I don't think that's the, <laughs> I don't think that's the part I was supposed to read, but we're introducing this new, um, this new king. And I'm going to have to try to give a little bit of a recap of last week so that we can be up to speed here. And we, of course, keep going back and forth between the, the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel. And obviously, remember this, that the southern kingdom is the tribe from which Jesus comes. And I talked about that a little bit this afternoon in Kansas City, how... Satan was trying to stop the seed of Christ. And so all throughout this line, you see him uh, trying to destroy people and, and uh, shut up the womb and do everything he can to stop Christ from coming. But of course, that doesn't happen. And so if you go to the genealogy of Christ, and since we've been doing this study and I'm kind of getting a little bit better in my mind who these kings are and, and uh, make, it's making a little bit more sense to me, go through the genealogies of Christ you recognize these names. They're not spelt the same way in the New Testament, but you can kind of see these kings and how this line is, is coming straight from, from here. Sometimes it'll skip a little generation, but it's still going through the same, same line. So if you remember, obviously they're all somewhat related because they're the split from, uh, uh, from Solomon. Well, I guess that's not true. He wasn't his, his son, but anyway. Uh, they're still, they still have some of the... Israel, Israel, you know, bloodline, okay, but, uh, but really when we follow this down, the granddaughter of Amri, I don't know that I ever said that, but I believe it's the, grand, the granddaughter of Amri, so is the daughter of, of Ahab, marries Jehoshaphat's son, um, eh Ahaziah, which this is her name, Athaliah. This is Ahab's daughter with Jezebel. What did I say? Okay. Uh, and so this is Jezebel's daughter, and she marries Ahaziah, which is Jehoshaphat's son. Now, what we mentioned is that uh, we, we, we mentioned, hold on, I got a little confused here for a second. Um, so let me say this. Yeah, that's right. Okay. <laughs> so, so, okay. So, we've been following this, and we talked about how this got mixed up because of this alliance made with Ahab. 
And no doubt with that, alliance, with that alliance is partially why his daughter married into this family and now we're having all sorts of problems, okay? So now we're going to meet uh, character Jehu. Can't do it. Who is the next king? And Jehu, we're going to see, the Bible says, is the son of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, who's not, I, th I think that's the, how, that's the name, who's not on here, you know, so, it's, so that's kind of a mystery. A lot of times if you, if you look at a chart, it'll have a question mark next to it because it's a little bit confusing. The problem is, as we look through this, he seems to be the child of Ahab, and so it gets real confusing, and he's, of course, on the northern, he's serving under the nor northern uh, tribe, the northern, uh, I'm talking about kingdom. And so I think what's going on here is the fact that he is his, uh, Jehoshaphat's son-in-law, okay, because of the, or, or I don't know, somehow he's just referred to as the son of, of Jehoshaphat. But remember how this all got confusing because these lines are mixed up, their names are even the same. You got Ahaziah here, Ahaziah there, Je Jehoram or Jerum. Uh, they're both serving at the same time, and so it gets real confusing. Uh, but anyway, today we're going to talk about Jehu. And the bottom line is everything from Jehoshaphat and this alliance right here, Jehu's goal is going to be to wipe them all out. <laughs> Just get rid of them all because they're all wicked. Okay, and so the title of the message, I realize it's more of a lesson or a study, but. Uh, the message is, Jehu gets the job done. He gets the job done. Now, we just read about how he says, um, come, he tells this man who, who, who's uh, from a different, he's not even, I think he's from Syria, and he says, come see my zeal for the Lord. And he gets into his chariot and he goes for a ride. Now, I imagine it's quite an exciting ride, and I'll show you why. Go back to... Uh, 2 Kings chapter 9, and look at verse 20. And the watchman told, saying, He came even unto them, and cometh not again. And the driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshi, for he driveth furiously. <laughs> okay. Now when you meet this, Character, you're going to see this just describes him. You're going to get this image in your head of Jehu. He's all business. He's go, go, go. He's driving furiously. Now, I don't know if you met somebody like this who's just like they're go, go, go. And so they even drive fast. And, you know, he was in a chariot, but same thing applies today. Like, you know, people like that. They got a lead foot and, and they're go, go, go. And people can't even recognize him coming. That looks like the driving of Jehu. <laughs> and so, uh, so this guy, you know, is, he gets to, to ride with him, and he goes on a trip, let me tell you. And he says, let me show you the zeal, my zeal for the Lord. And so he's going to finish it up. And we're going to get to that part in a minute. But the works of Jehu were actually prophesied way back uh, in the time of Elijah, um, before some of these kings even reigned, you know, he already prophesied. So go back to 1 Kings 19, and we'll look at that. 1 Kings 19 is where Elijah, and of course, now that Jehu's going to be reigning, he's reigning in the time of Elisha, Elijah's predecessor, uh, uh, I mean, uh, what do you call it? The guy that followed him. <laughs> but, uh, he, uh, you know, but this is Elijah's prophecy here in 1 Kings chapter 9, verse, let me see here, 1 Kings 9, I'll just read 1 through 10. No, that's not right. I'm sorry, 19 is what I told you, right? Not 9. 1 Kings 19. I'll start at verse 11. <clears throat> and he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great uh, and strong wind rent the mountains and break it in pieces, the rock before the Lord. 
but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. You're familiar with this passage with Elijah. God speaking to him through this, this voice, and it says, After the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire, a still small voice. And it was so, when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in a mantle and went out and stood in the entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, jealous for the Lord, God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I, am, uh, le I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. This is, of course, Jezebel's going after him at this time. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, anoint Haziel to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shall thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shephat, uh, of uh, Abilah Mahola, uh, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. Okay, so all these things come to place after, uh, after the, the rule of Ahab, obviously. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Yet have I left my seven, yet, yet have I left me. 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which whom the, uh, with whom, <laughs> which have not bowed unto, ba unto Baal. Man, I can't speak. And every mouth which hath not kissed him. Okay, so Elijah's making this prophecy of uh, Jehu. I'm assuming he was already around. He's just a young guy at the time. And, uh, but God tells him hey, he's the one who's going to be the king and he's going to kill all these people, and the ones that he doesn't kill, Elisha will kill, and this is the prophecy that was made. So now, under, that was 1 Kings, now under Elisha's service, we see uh, he's going to be anointed king. So go to chapter, 2 Kings chapter 9. 2 Kings chapter 9. And this is what I was trying to take you to earlier. And so I'll start reading. And Elisha the prophet called one of the children of the prophets and said unto him, Gird up thy loins and take this box of oil in thine hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. And when thou cometh, comest thither, look out, there, Je, look out there, Jehu the son of Je, Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, and go in and make him arise up from among his brethren and carry him to an, inter, to an inner chamber. Then take the box of oil and pour it on his head and say, Thus saith the Lord, I have anointed thee king over Israel. Then open the door and flee and tarry not. So the young man, even the young man, uh, the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead. And when he had come, behold, the captain of the host, uh, host were sitting, and the captains of the host were sitting and said, I have an errand to thee. O captain, and Jehu said, Unto which of all uh, uh, which of all us? And he said, To thee, O captain. And he arose and went into the house, and he poured the oil, the oil on his head, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed thee king over the people of the Lord, even over Israel. And thou shalt smite the house of Ahab thy master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall, and him that is shut up and left in Israel. And I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah. And the dogs shall eat Jezebel in the portion of Jezreel, and there shall be none to bury her. And he opened the door and fled. So... Forget where I was, what I was getting ready to say. <laughs> so anyway, you remember that the prophecy was that Jezebel was going to die, and he also says that Ahab was going to die. However, Ahab had humbled himself at the end, and he had kind of 
in a way repented and gotten right with the Lord. And so he said, it's not, you're going to die. You're not going to see all these things happen, but it'll happen in your son's, son's time. And so Jezebel's still alive, but Ahab has already died. And he said, I'm going to make your house like the house of Baasha. If you remember, Zimri had him killed. And, uh, and then Baasha had had Jeroboam's family killed. And so they keep trying to kill everybody in the family and starting all over again in Israel. And so uh, this is what's going on. And now we see that, uh, you know, Jehu gets the word that this is what he's supposed to do. And so here, here are some of the major accomplishments of Jehu. Now, unfortunately, at the very end, we're going to see that he still ends up being, unfortunately, I, I really, I got my green marker right here. I really want to put a smiley face right here, but we're going to see that he ends up being just as much of a red X as Jeroboam was when he started all this. Okay, but I really want to give him a smiley face because what he does is great all the way up to the end. In fact, I wanted to originally do this in two sermons, and I was just going to do the first part was the beginning of his reign, which was good, and then the end was kind of like the bad news. But I just decided we're going to do it all together. The bad news would be the conclusion, and I'll give us some application. But we see that even though he ends up doing wrong, let's get a sneak peek, go to 2 Kings uh, chapter 10, verse 30. And the Lord said unto Jehu, Because thou hast done well in executing that which is right in mine eyes, uh, and hast done unto the house of Ahab according to all that was in mine heart, thy children of the fourth generation shall sit, shall sit on the throne of Israel. Okay, but we see in that context, and I'll read it here in a little bit, that he actually doesn't have a heart for the Lord entirely. But God, just like he did with Ahab, spares him and says, hey, I'm going to let your children be, uh, continue to be on the throne. But you're, you, you, he still doesn't get the, the privileges because of the fact that he did evil still in God's sight. So, but I want to tell this first part of his story where he's very zealous for the Lord and he's doing the things that he's supposed to do. And, uh, and then we'll get to the bad news at the end. Okay, so first of all, here are some of the major accomplishments that he does, okay? He's going to overthrow uh, Jehoram of Israel. Where's my marker? He's going to overthrow Jehoram of Israel. That's the first step because he's going to take his place. At this point, he's still the reigning king. So he's got to overthrow him, and he's going to put him to death. Okay, that's chapter 9, 2 Kings 9, verse 14. So Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, conspired against Joram. Now Joram had uh, kept Ramoth Gilead, he and all Israel, because of Hazael, king of Syria. But King Joram was returned to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds which the Syrians had given him when he fought with Hazael, king of Syria. And Jehu said, If it be your minds, then let none go forth nor escape out of the city to go to tell it to Jezreel. So Jehu rode in a chariot and went to Jezreel, and Joram lay there. And Ahaziah, king of Judah, was come down to see Joram. And there stood a watchman on the tower in Jezreel, and, and he spied the company of Jehu as he came and said, I see a company. And Jerem said, Take an horseman and send to meet them, and let him say, Is it peace? So there went one on horseback to meet him and said, Thus saith the king, Is it peace? And Jehu said, What hast thou to do with peace? Turn thee behind me. And the watchman told, saying, The messenger came to them, but he had come not again. Then he sent out a second on horseback, which came to them and said, Thus saith the king, Is it peace? And Jehu answered, What hast thou do, to do with peace? Tur, uh, turn thee behind me. And the watchman told, saying, He came even unto them, and cometh not again. And the driving is like the driving of Jehu the son of Nimshi, for he driveth furiously. So it's obvious that this guy's coming 
And Jehoram is looking at him thinking, hey, this is not a good, a, a good thing. Keeps sending out these watchmen saying, is, are, is this good? Are you a friend or foe? You know, is everything peace? But he keeps on going and he's not answering. He's like, what do you have to do with peace? And so uh, we see that he's out to, to get him. Okay, so where did I leave off right there? Uh, let's see. Verse... 21, and Joram, and Joram said, make ready, and his chariot was made ready, and Joram king of Israel and Ahaziah king of Judah went out each in his chariot. See, there's still an alliance formed between them. And they went out against Jehu and met him in the portion of Naboth, the Jezreelite. And it came to pass when Joram saw Jehu that he said, is it peace, Jehu? And he answered, What peace, so long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many? And Joram turned his hands and fled, uh, and, and fled, and said to Ahaziah, There is treachery, O ah Ahaziah. And Jehu drew a bow with his full strength and smote Joram between his arms, and the arrow went out of his heart, and he sunk down in the chariot. Okay, so the first thing we see is that he kills Jer uh, Jehoram, uh, Ahab's son, and he casts him into Naboth's field. Now, you remember the story of Naboth, right? This is the field that Ahab wanted, and he said, I'm not going to give you this. This has been passed down to me from generations. And so Ahab goes and cries to Jezebel, and Jezebel ends up taking it from him, basically, and giving it to Ahab. And so this is kind of like getting him back, saying, hey, you're going to be killed, and you're just going to be left in Naboth's field to be eaten by the dogs and, and what have you. And so, so this is the end of Jerem and Jehoram, and now Jehu is on the throne. But he's not done yet. Okay, so the second thing he's going to do, remember Ahaziah, the king of Judah, uh, is also kind of aligned with Jehoram, and so now he's going to put him to death as well, which unfortunately leaves his mother... Jezebel's daughter as acting uh, ruler for a little while. Okay, so the second thing he does in his in his uh, king uh, his uh, rule is that he kills Ahaziah, the king of Judah. So let's look at verse twenty-seven. But when Ahaziah, the king of Judah, saw this, he fled by the way of the garden house, and Jehu followed after him and said, "Smite him also in the chariot." And they did so as the going up to Gur, um, which is by Eblium, and he fled to Megiddo and died there. And his servants carried him in the chariot to Jerusalem and buried him in his sepulcher with his fathers in the city of David. And in the eleventh year of Joram, the son of Ahab, began Ahaziah to reign uh, over Judah. And, and uh, when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her face and tired her head and looked out at the window. So the next thing we're going to see, the third thing, is that he's going to hunt down Jezebel. And Jezebel looks out the window, knows why he's come. You'll find that out here in a minute. And she paints her face. Now, I don't know what that means, but a lot of people use that as the one negative thing about makeup in the Bible. They're like, hey, you don't paint your face because Jezebel painted her face. I don't know if it was warrior pain or if she just tried to make herself, you know, maybe, you know, she just had to put a lot of makeup on to be even seen in public. <laughs> I don't know. But she paints her face and she tires her hair. She's got some kind of headdress on her hair. And she looks out the window as she meets Jehu coming. So verse 30. And when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel, I'm sorry, she painted her face. We already talked about that. Looked out the window. And Jehu entered in at the gate. As Jehu entered in the gate, she said, Had Zimri peace who slew his master? What's she talking about? Well, remember, Zimri, you know, he overthrew the kingdom here. And he killed all of the descendants of Baasha in God ends up making sure that he ends up getting, uh, you know, killed as well later on as kind of punishment for that. But what he did wasn't actually wrong. It's just that, uh, you know, I mean, what he, what he did fulfilled God's purposes, but it was still wrong for him to do that. And so he ends up getting it, getting it back. So anyway, 
What Jezebel is trying to do here is turn it on him and make him feel like, you know, I better not rise up against my, you know, my, my queen here, my authority. The thing is, she's not an authority. He's the acting king. He knows that she's a wicked woman, and he goes there meaning business, and he's going to get the job done. He's going to put her to death once and for all. Okay, so verse um, 32, thank you. And he lifted up his face to the window and said, Who is on my side? Who? And, and there looked out to him two or three eunuchs. Now, these would have been servants, no doubt, to Jezebel, you know, that she's probably been bossing them around for, for a long time, and they probably can't wait to see this happen. <laughs> so and these eunuchs are, are uh, there in their, her presence, and they look out the window, and he says, who's on my side? Who? And he said, throw her down. So they threw her down, and some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses, and he trod her underfoot. Jehu didn't play around. He said, hey, are you on my side? Throw her out of the window. Threw her out of the window, runs over her with the chariot, <laughs> okay, and, uh, and trod her underfoot. And when uh, he was come in, he did eat and drink. Apparently, he went into her house and ate her food. <laughs> go, uh, or, and he said, go, see now this cursed woman. And bury her, for she is a king's daughter. Now, I don't think he, rem he knew the prophecy where, where Elijah said she's not going to be buried. Now, he's thinking, hey, she's a king's daughter. Out of respect, we're going to bury him like, we, like he did the, um, Ahaziah and, uh, and Jeroboam. But, uh, <clears throat> but anyway, I, th I think I left something out here. No, that's right. Okay. So, uh, but anyway, so... <clears throat> So he says, uh, go bury her. But Elijah had said, she's not going to be buried. The dogs are going to eat her. Okay, so look what happens. But they found no more of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. The dogs had come. I don't know if we're talking about wolves or what the case is, but they came and they uh, devoured her. And that's all that was left, just like it was prophesied. Wherefore, they came again and told him, and he said, this is the word of the Lord which he spake by his servants, Eli servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, In the portion of Jezreel shall dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel. So apparently he did remember the words at that point. And the carcass of Jezebel shall be as dung upon the face of the field in the portion of Jezreel, so that they shall not say, This is Jezebel. All right, so we see these prophecies coming uh, to pass. The next thing he does, look at chapter 10 is he goes and he finds the rest of Ahab's family, his sons, uh, so that none of them can be king and none of them can continue on in the wickedness. And so, chapter 10, and Ahab has 70 sons in Samaria. Now, we already talked about this a few, uh, few lessons back, the sons of Ahab. And Jehu wrote letters and sent to Samaria unto the rulers of Jezreel, to the elders and to them that brought up Ahab's children, saying, now, as soon as this letter cometh to you, seeing your master's sons are with you, and there are with you chariots and horses, a fenced city also, and armor, look even out the best and meetest of your master's sons, and set him on his father's throne, and fight for your master's house. But they were exceedingly afraid, and said, Behold, two kings stood not before him. How then shall we stand? And he that was over the house, and he that was over the city, and the elders also, and the bringers up of the children sent to Jehu, saying, We are thy servants, and will do all that thou shalt bid us. We will not make any king, so thou, uh, that, uh, so that, thou that which is good in thine eyes. Do that which is good in your own eyes. So, so you see what happened? He's saying, uh, you know, hey, you got his 70 sons there. That's a lot of sons. He says, pick one of them. Pick the best one. Make him the king. Go ahead and round up an army, whatever you want to do. And fight for your master. He's like challenging them to a fight. Hey, pick your best man. And they said, you know what? We'd rather not. <laughs> We'd rather be on your side, Jehu. And so then listen how he's like, all right, you want to be on my side? Here's how we'll know your loyalty. He wrote a letter the second time, verse 6, <clears throat> saying, If ye be mine, and if ye will hearken unto my voice, take ye the heads of the men your master's sons, 
and come to me in Jezreel by tomorrow this time. Now this time, if you remember, taking the heads doesn't mean take your leaders, take your, the rulers of your tribes. This means literally take their heads, okay? We'll know that real soon. Now the king's sons, being 70 persons, uh, were with the great men of the city which brought them up and it came to pass when the letter came to them that they took the king's sons and slew 70 persons and put their heads in baskets and set, sent them to Jezreel, uh, Jezreel and there came a messenger and told him saying they have brought the heads of the king's sons and he said lay ye them in two heaps at the entering in of the gate until morning and it came to pass in the morning that he went out and stood and said to all the people ye be righteous Behold, I conspired against my master and slew him, but who slew all these? Know not that there shall fall unto the earth nothing of the word of the Lord, which the Lord spake concerning the house of Ahab, for the Lord hath done that which he spake by his servant Elijah. So Jehu slew all that remained of the house of Ahab in Jezreel, and all his great men, and his kinfolk, and his priests, until he left, not, uh, left him none remaining." Man, this guy Jehu, <laughs> he isn't messing around. He's not afraid to say whatever he has to say to get people out there. And he doesn't, he's not afraid to have them killed or to kill them himself or to run over them with the chariot or, or, uh, or whatever, whatever he needs to do. And so he's just doing the business. And the crazy thing about all this is this is all stuff that God said was his desire. This is what... This is the reason that Jehu is going to be spared later on because he's like, you know what? You did all that was in my heart to do. And it's hard to think about that and read that and say, hey, this is what God wanted to happen. He wanted Jezebel to be dead and left in the field and the dogs eat her up. He wanted to have these men slain and, and all these guys put to death. It's hard to imagine. But this is how wicked they were and what they were doing to God's name and how they were perverting the people and causing them to go after Baal and all this stuff. And so God was using this man Jehu to get the job done. And boy, was he getting it done. So then uh, the next thing he's going to do, he meets uh, Ahaziah of Judah. He meets his brothers. So a minute ago, I, I kind of met. I keep getting these mixed up because all their names are the same, okay? So now he's going to go to Ahaziah of Judah, and he's going to have all of his brothers killed. He already had him killed. Now he's going to have his brothers killed, okay? And that's uh, verse 12 and 14. He arose, and he arose and departed and came to Samaria. And as he was at the shearing house in the way, Jehu met with the brethren of Ahaziah, king of Judah, and said, Who are ye? And they answered, We are the brethren of Ahaziah. And we go down to salute the children of the king of the children, uh, and the children of the queen. And he said, Take them alive. And they took them alive and slew them at the pit of the shearing house, even two and forty men. Neither left he any of them. All right? But he's not done yet. <laughs> okay, he's going to uh, go a little bit further. Now the next thing he's going to do is he's going to trick all the prophets of Baal, and he's going to have them killed. So let's see how he tricks them. Verse uh, 15. And when he was departed thence, he lighted on Jeho Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, coming to meet him. We already read this verse. And he saluted him and, uh, and said unto him, Is thine heart right as my heart is with thy heart? And Jehonadab answered, It is. If it be, give me thine hand. And he gave him his hand, and he took him up to him into the chariot. And he said, Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. So they made him ride in the chariot. And when he came to Samaria, he slew all that remained unto Ahab in Samaria, till he had destroyed him uh, according to the saying of the Lord, which he spake to Elijah. And Jehu gathered all, people, all the people together and said unto them, Ahab served Baal a little, but Jehu will serve him much. So he's getting the prophets of Baal excited because he's like, hey, you thought Ahab was loyal to Baal. Wait till you see me. I'm going to serve him much. Makes him seem like he's on their side. He's just flat out lying, but still. Now, therefore, call unto me all the prophets of Baal, all his servants, and all the priests. Let none be wanting, for I have a great sacrifice to do to Baal. <laughs> Guess who the sacrifice is going to be? Whosoever shall be wanting, he shall not live. But Jehu did it in subtlety, 
to the intent that he might destroy the worshipers of Baal. And Jehu said, Proclaim a solemn assembly for Baal. And they proclaimed it. And Jehu sent through all Israel, and all the worshipers of Baal came, so that there was not a man left that came not. And they came into the house of Baal, and the house of Baal was full from one end to the other, to another. And he said unto him that was over the vestry, Bring forth vestments for, the, uh, for all the worshipers of Baal. And he brought them forth vestments. And Jehu went, and Jehonadab, Je Jehonadab the son of Rechab, into the house of Baal, and said unto the worshipers of Baal, Search, and look, that there be here with you none of the servants of the Lord, but the worshipers of Baal only. And when they went in to offer sacrifices and burnt offerings, Jehu appointed fourscore men without, and said, If any of the men which I have brought into your hands escape, he that letteth him go, his life shall be for the life of him. And it came to pass, as soon as he had made the end of the offering of the burnt offerings, that Jehu said to the guard of the captains, Go in and slay them, let not, none come forth. And they smote uh, them with the edge of the sword, and the guard and the captains uh, cast them out and went to the city of the house of Baal. And they brought forth the images out of the house of Baal and burned them. And they break down the image of Baal, and they break down the house of Baal, and made it a drought house unto this day. Thus Jehu destroyed Baal out of Israel. So you see what he's, what he's done now. All the stuff that Ahab brought upon Israel because he married Jezebel, and she had her prophets of Baal, and all that they did, and all the deception and the, uh, you know, causing Israel to go after idols, and then hooking up, making an allowance here to where Jehoshaphat, which was a good man, his sons are, are his son and his son's son are now uh, wicked too, and they're going after this because you know he's married Jezebel's daughter, and so all of this is is just just some wickedness going on. Jehu comes on the scene as he, as Elijah had prophesied and says, "I'm going to clean it all up." Kills all the remaining sons of Ahab and all his family. Kills Jehor Je Jehoram and, Ahi and Ahaziah and Ahaziah of Judah and his brethren. I guess Ahaziah is already gone. And, uh, and his brethren and, uh, and, and, you know, Jezebel and the whole lot, all the prophets of Baal. He's cleaned it all up, right? He's made actually Israel a decent place to live again. Uh, and he's made uh, Judah, set them back on the path right after uh, a, a Athaliah is, is done. And so here's the thing, like all this story, all this stuff that I just said, doesn't it sound like, it sounds like a movie that I'd be like, no, you know what, that movie's a little too violent. We probably shouldn't watch that movie, <laughs> okay? It'd be exciting for sure, but I'd be like, that's a pretty violent movie, you know? But man, this is real stuff that happened. This is history and this is the Bible and we can't like overlook it and say like that's too gruesome or that we shouldn't do that. This is actually something as hard as it is to imagine, that please the Lord. Now, there's going to come a day, you know, the Battle of Armageddon, you've heard of that. <laughs> there's going to come a day where God is going to, and I don't know, it's possible we're all going to be there with them, or uh, at least 144,000 or whatever, and we are going to be, you know, slaying all the wicked people that remain who have turned from God and hardened their hearts. And uh, right now, that's not, in our that's not our job to ever retaliate or use force like that to kill somebody who's wicked if it's not our our judgment to make but one day it will be and one day God will get revenge and he'll be avenged of all his adversaries and all the people who are worshipers of these false gods and all that and so he says there that Jehu what he actually did was a good thing we already read from verse 30 where he said, Because thou hast done well in executing that which is right in mine eyes, and hast done unto the house of Ahab uh, according to all that was in mine heart. Right? So he's saying that this is a good thing. But here's the problem. Go back to verse 29. How be it from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, Jehu departed not from after them, to wit, the golden calves that were in Bethel and that were in Dan. Now, if, if you don't remember, here's what happened. 
when the kingdom was split, remember for a while, he looked like he was going to be the good guy. Because he was wicked and he was, uh, you know, going to, uh, you know, after all these other, other gods. <laughs> Jeroboam is kind of blessed in a way. God allows him to get this position and he's not going after the other gods. But what he does is he's here in Samaria and he says, okay, the southern kingdom is, is where Jerusalem is. Okay, where Jerusalem has the, you know, the, the blessed place, if you will, the temple. And he says, you know, if, if, all, if he is allowed to continue on, all of the people that I, in the ten tribes that I'm ruling over, you know, they're going to see that this is going on. They're going to go down to the temple, and whenever they see it, they're going to be like, well, who are we to go against God's anointed and so they'll go back. And so he says, what can I do to keep them from going to the temple of God? And so what he says is we're going to make these places right here, one in Bethel and one in Dan, we're going to make these the religious places. And instead of building a temple there, he built, I don't know what kind of shrines or whatever he has, but he says we're going to make these golden calves, golden calf here and a golden calf here. And what you do is you'll come and when you worship the Lord, these will be representations of, of your God. Okay, so that reminds you of the story in Exodus where Moses is up getting the commandments and the people of Israel are down worshiping these golden calves. And Aaron, the priest of God, is saying, Behold your gods which brought you out of Egypt. And so he's, in a sense, making reference to the real God, Jehovah, but they're worshiping in, in this strange way. They're not obeying and doing what they're supposed to do. And they're even representing him with these golden calves, which he never said to do. So the problem with Jehu is, even though he said, these prophets of Baal are wicked, and these guys that brought in, not Jehoshaphat, but uh, Ahab and all these, brought in this worship of Baal, these false gods and all these wicked, you know, Jezebel and her witchcrafts and all these things, they've got to be put to death. Yet, he's really no better than Jeroboam because he continues to follow after those golden calves and worship them in that way. Now, here's the thing. When he said, come see my zeal for the Lord, was he re did he really have zeal for the Lord? I would say yes. Was he, did he have zeal for Baal? No. He wanted Baal and the Baal worshippers put to death. He, didn't have wor he wasn't worshipping any other god. In his mind, he was worshipping Jehovah God. He was worshipping the true God of Israel. The problem is he was worshipping him in such a way that even at the end of his life, after he did all these things that God wanted him to do, God said, you know what? You're still, you're not making me happy. You're still a bad king because you're allowing Israel to go after, you know, not go to the true place that they're supposed to worship. Instead, they're going after these golden calves. And even though they're claiming to follow me, they're not following me. And so for the application, the conclusion I want to make is this. No matter how zealous one is for the Lord, I mean, take, make no mistake about it, Jehu was zealous for the Lord. He did the work, man. He went out there and he was... You know, but no matter how zealous you are for the Lord, their zeal, if their zeal is not according to knowledge, knowledge about who the true God is, how he wants to worship, and, and, and doing that, you know, then they can't expect to have God's favor. Now, God might spare them in some situations. You know, I believe that God has, has spared the United States in many ways because some of the rulers have risen up with some godly standards to an extent and they've said there's certain things that we're not going to do and God had, you know, kind of blessed the nation. And there are other times where the nation has kind of gotten away from that and we've seen some, some bad things happen. But look, that doesn't make the rulers good godly people if they're not worshiping God the way they're supposed to worship even if they're making some good decisions, even if they're claiming to worship the same God we worship, hey, listen to what they're saying. It could be that they're worshiping golden calves and just claiming to worship God. Okay, now that's a political statement. What about the leaders of churches today? Same thing. 
on Facebook and other places I see shared all the time, people sharing these, these, these preachers that everybody knows. Look at this guy. Oh, have you listened to this clip yet? Oh, listen to this guy, his zeal for the Lord. And he's just turning hearts to the Lord and he's making people repent of their sins and he's doing all these wonderful exploits and stuff. And I'm like, wait a minute, I'm listening to what he's saying and he's preaching a works-based salvation. Yeah, but you don't understand, but he just loves the Lord and he loves the Bible and he's doing all these things. Yeah, but he's preaching a false gospel. Oh, that's okay. You know, at least he's preaching to God and they're sharing this stuff and they're saying, hey, worship this guy and he's such a great guy. And you know what they're doing? They're worshiping golden calf that God never said to worship. He's like, what you need to do is worship me the way I said to worship you and preach me the way you need to preach. Now, these guys, yes, they're preaching holiness. Praise the Lord for that. Yes, they're talking about Jesus. Praise the Lord for that. The Apostle Paul even said, you know what? I, I forget the Apostle Paul. He said it too, but Jesus said, hey, you know what? If they're not, if they're not against me, <laughs> you know, they're not my, I'm not going to stop them from doing what they're doing. You know, who, who cares? You know, they're, they're at least preaching my name. My name is being spread. However, they're not actually with him. <laughs> Does that make sense? And, and, and the application I get is, you know, I don't have any reason to try to, now if they're preaching a false gospel, that's a different story, but I don't have any reason to try to shut down another man's ministry or try to preach against them, stop people going to a certain church or whatever. Who cares if Jesus is being preached, you know, they're not my enemy. You know, I'm more against this people that are preaching, uh, you know, humanism and, and all this kind of stuff. Or like I said, the false gospel is one thing. But people who, who just, you know, they're not doing things quite the way we want them, and they're not worshiping uh, God the way that they, they should worship Him, whatever. You know, maybe they're doing some good things for society, good things for the community or whatever. And I'm not necessarily trying to put a stop to that. But here's the thing. God is not going to be happy with us worshiping golden calves. Even if we're claiming to do it in the name of God, in the name of Jehovah, uh, he's not going to be happy with that. He wants us to worship him his way and do what the Bible says and not be interested in what the Jeroboams of the world have, have given us as a substitute, you know, so that we won't lose our loyalty to them or whatever. Jehu had a zeal, but not according to knowledge. And it's interesting, <clears throat> this is how Israel continued to be for a long time. Maybe not specifically with the golden calves, but uh, but by Romans chap in Romans chapter ten, Paul says this, and this is it. That we're done after this. Paul said, "For I bear them record." He's talking about his heart's desire for Israel is that they might be saved. He said, "For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge." And I believe that was what the problem was with Jehu. He did some great exploits for the Lord. He accomplished some things that God wanted them to him to accomplish. But at the end of the day, his zeal wasn't according to knowledge, and he didn't have it right by any means. So he was still doing wickedly. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you help us not to get distracted by false uh, types of worship and, and uh, false uh, explanations of who you are, particularly, Lord, false gospels. Lord, we, we know that the power... Uh, the power of your word to save souls is, is uh, something that, that should be the priority of all that we believe. And so I pray that you help us not to get uh, entangled with uh, the, any kind of people that would preach false gospels or even those who would worship in a way that you don't want to worship. Lord, we, we, we're glad that they're preaching the name of Jesus. We're glad that they're doing good works and in many cases, and, and, uh, and pushing for holiness and all, uh, but, but help us to understand that we need to do things the way you want them to be done, and that we're not interested in holding hands with the world and doing all the things the world wants us to do, and things that are pleasing, and, uh, and maybe what some would consider safe, but Lord, I pray that you'll help our zeal for you to be that according to knowledge, and that we would do right uh, no matter what the cost and no matter what we think might happen if we do. And I pray you be glorified by this church and, and our, uh, the works that we get accomplished. In Jesus' name, amen.